Hi, second graders. Welcome back to your TV classroom. Today is Monday, February 8th. I hope you had a great weekend. My family this weekend, we just hung out at home and played and spent time together as a family, and it was wonderful. And I hope you had a great weekend as well. Before we begin our learning, let's check in with our zones. Hmm. You know, Mr. Kevin, I'm in the green zone today. I'm feeling calm and content and ready to go. That's great. I'm in the green zone too. Oh, that's so good. I bet it's going to be a good taping of the TV classroom. It's Monday. Woohoo! Not only that, it's Make It Monday. That's right. I love Make It Monday. So, friends, let's take a look at the number we need to make today. How are you going to make the number 68? Hmm. Well, we could do the good old expanded form. That's always good. How else could we make 68? Oh, Pebble. Pebble said 34 plus 34. You split the 60 and the 8 in half. I like it. Hmm. What if we did? Oh, excuse me. That yawn snuck up on me. What if we did 43 plus, what would we need? 25. That would make 68. Mr. Kevin, can you think of a way to make 68? I like the idea of multiplication. Ooh. So half of 68 would be 34, right? You, yep. you already, yeah. Times two. I bet that means 34 times two means 34 plus 34. Mm-hmm. Or oh. 17 <gasps> times four. Oh, that's really interesting. What about this one, Mr. Kevin? 70 minus two. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. That's a Mr. good one. Mr. Kevin loves subtraction. Okay, let's see what we're going to learn today. Today we're learning to use skip counting as a mental math strategy. So far, we've been talking about how can you show it, how can you see it, and now we're going to talk about numbers and their patterns and how they help us solve problems mentally. So the first task you're going to have today is to count by fives and write them in order all the way to 45. Go ahead, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Go. <laughs> Okay, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. Now keep that in your brain because we're going to use that as we're working today. Amy is counting the pencils at the school. Mr. Kevin. I did not pay attention to my punctuation. I stopped at the end of the line and there was no period or comma there. And that didn't make any sense. Amy is counting the pencils at the school. Store by fives. Friends. I don't know. Look at it. It says, here's the way I read it. Amy is counting the pencils at the school store by fives. Yes, that's much better. So. My brain stopped at the end, and sometimes I see friends doing that when they're reading. Did you know that you use your reading skills you learn when you're doing math? And even sometimes when you're doing math, you use your reading, and when you're doing reading, you use your math, and they all go together. So we have to be strong mathematicians and strong readers. 
So let's try that again. Amy is counting the pencils at the school store by fives. She has counted 45 so far. What are the next six numbers Amy says? Okay, so go ahead, write for me the next six numbers Amy says. She's counted 45. So what are the next six numbers she's gonna say? 50, great. 55, mm-hmm. 60, great. 65, 70, 75. So how many pencils does the school store have if we assume that that's the rest of the pencils? They have 75 pencils. Oh, we just wrote that, didn't we? What were the six? Oh, do you think you can remember what they were? I know we got to 75, so maybe we should put 75 first. 75, 70, 65, 60, 55, 50. There we are. Ta-da! Great job counting by fives. Now, it says you can skip count by other numbers too. You can skip count forward and you can skip count backward. The pattern shows skip counting forward by tens. The tens digit changes each time. Write the missing numbers. So let's look at this number pattern. 130, 140, 150. Let's look. 130, 140, 150. What digit am I gonna put in the tens place next? A six, because three, four, five, six. Then it's gonna be what? 170 and 180. Great! This pattern, mm, I'm not gonna tell you, you might read it, but try not to read it. Just look at the numbers below and let's see if we can figure it out and then read it and see if we're correct. What's the pattern of these numbers? We've got 700, 600, 500. What do you think is gonna come next? Why do you think 400? Oh, each time the hundreds place value is going down by one, one group of 100, or the digits moving down one digit, seven, six, five, four, 300, and what's the last one? 200, let's read. This pattern shows skip counting backwards by hundreds. The hundreds digit changes each time. Write the missing numbers. We got it, awesome job. So what would be the next number in the skip counting backwards by hundreds pattern above? Ooh, hmm. What would be the next number? Well, we would have 100. What's the next number? Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. I will tell you that even as an adult, zero makes me nervous. Mr. Kevin, does zero make you nervous? Not really. It makes me nervous because I'm like, is it really zero? Is it really nothing? Because when I went to school, it was always find the answer, find the answer, find the answer. And finding zero felt like I wasn't finding the answer. Where now we get to learn, think about it, think about it, think about it, make sense, find the pattern, say what makes sense. So I have to learn to not be nervous about zero because zero is okay. If I have 100 and I skip back to 100, I'm going to land on zero. There's going to be no more. And you might have that same thing where zero feels like it's the wrong answer. If you can prove it's the right answer, you go for it. Now, Mr. Kevin, can you show my whiteboard? Yes. I'm going to write 
three numbers in a pattern. And I want you to see if you can figure out the pattern. We don't need the PowerPoint, just, oh, okay. just the whiteboard. You're gonna see if you can figure out what the pattern is. Okay, here we go. Ooh, I'm gonna scoot over. Ooh, I'll here have the go. board over. Get oh, there we go, perfect. There. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. Okay, so here's what I'm going to write. Can you figure out what the pattern is? Take a look. This is when we're doing that whole figure out what we know. What are you noticing about these numbers? I noticed the same thing. The tens place is a one. Okay. What else are you noticing? That the ones place is changing. Okay. How does it change? What's happening between these numbers? From 14 to 16 is what? Plus two. From 16 to 18 is what? Plus two. So what do you think my next number is going to be? Yes, it's 20. And my next number? 22. And my last number? 24. Are you ready for a challenge? What number goes here? Hmm. What do you think? Did you say 12? If you did, you were correct because I'm adding two each time going forward. So if I'm adding two going forward, then I'm subtracting two going backward. Fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna erase that. Now, hmm, I'm thinking of a new pattern. What number is going to come next? What are you noticing? What's changing? The tens place is changing. It's going up by one ten each time. So I'm adding 10 each time. So what's my next number? Yeah, my place value, my tens place has to go up one digit. So 134. 144, 154, 164. A lot of times students think when the pattern's counting by 10, we're always gonna be on 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. But you can have a counting by 10 pattern starting with any number. And you just add 10 more, add 10 more, add 10 more. Mr. Kevin, how long have we been going for? 14. Perfect. Today's gonna be a short lesson, friends, because it's just an introduction to patterns. So. Lucky for you, short lesson today. I want you to think about the patterns you see all around you. So that's part of your assignment today, is to really think about the patterns you see and you notice and maybe even pick, um, pull out your hundreds chart and see if you can start to spot any patterns on that hundreds chart. So your homework today is to do page 369 and 370 in your math workbook. Today we learned to use skip counting as a mental math strategy. We remembered what we knew about counting by fives. We were skip counting to count on by fives from a number, ending in zero or five, and we are identifying the patterns we were seeing with our skip counting. Now, if you would like to send us some patterns you're seeing or some skip counting you're doing here at the TV classroom, Mr. Kevin will let you know how to do that. You know, Mrs. Wally, I was thinking about patterns in nature Oh, yes. So many patterns so in nature. So many patterns in nature. So students, you can send us anything that you see in nature, a picture 
or a counting of maybe bumps on a leaf or you know, whatever you want, to TV Classroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us. Ask your adult for help. You can also mail it to TV Classroom at 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. All right, friends, awesome job today. Now, you need to get your learning buddy and yourself ready for your time with Miss Oslin today. So, during your break, Make sure you locate your learning buddy if you don't already have them with you, which you should, but sometimes, you know, it happens. Make sure to have that learning buddy. Take a break. Take care of your needs and be ready to learn when she comes on the screen. Thank you for being with me today. Have a great rest of your Monday, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Rules. One, you have 10 seconds to pick your crewmate. Two, a new timer will appear with an exercise for the crewmate you picked. Three, you will get 10 points for each correct crewmate and exercise you choose. Four, if you pick the imposter, you will lose all your points. Five, see how many points you can get. Good luck.
Hi, second graders. Welcome back from your break. Excellent job gathering your materials. Go ahead and put your ELA packet and your pencil off to the side. You won't need those yet, but go ahead and hold on to your learning buddy if they are going to help you focus. Now, let's review what we've been learning about. We've been learning about different types of fiction. And we learned that fiction stories are stories that are made up from our author's imagination. And there's even within the genre of fiction, there are different types of fiction. We have been reading traditional re literature, which are stories that are passed down from one group to another, and they include folk tales, fairy tales, tall tales, legends, fables, and myths. What do you know about these types of stories? Do you remember? Let me show you one more graphic. We talked about traditional literature, stories from around the world, passed down from generation, and often told orally, which means out loud. And then we also have realistic fiction and fantasy fiction. Take some think time to try to remind yourself. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you remember. Okay, Gus, I remember that traditional literature is often like the graphic organizer says, or the chart says, stories from around the world, they're passed down and they're often told orally and there's often more than one version of similar stories. Realistic fiction are made up from our author's imagination but they can seem real, can seem like problems or people that I would have or know. And fantasy fiction, I know, is something that's totally made up, could never really happen, like characters who are animals that are talking or um, fanciful stories or things that are just really wild and out there. We also learned that fiction is, has a structure to it. There's a sequence of the events. There's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And we learned about the beginning, the middle, and the end of one of our traditional tales, Little Red Riding Hood. And we read a newfangled prairie tale, and it was a little bit different than the more traditional version that most of us have read. Let's see how this version is similar to or different from another Little Red Riding Hood version because today we're learning to notice patterns and make text-to-text -text connections as I read a variety of texts. What that means is we're noticing what is the same, what is happening over and over in our books that are similar, and we're thinking about one text and connecting it to another, thinking at how they are similar or how they are different. And we're going to do that today as we read what really happened to Little Red Riding Hood, The Wolf's Story by Toby Forward and illustrated by Izar Cohen. So look at this front cover. This is another twist on the traditional folk tale of The Little Red Riding Hood. And we've already read a newfangled version, like I said, of Little Red Riding Hood. This one is The Prairie we're gonna use this graphic organizer to help us think about the book we already read. And I have it already filled out for us, breaking down our characters, our setting, and the beginning, the middle, and the end. Now, let's remind ourselves, get your hand up and we'll say our little chant that we learned from Miss Mays. Here we go. These are the story elements of a fiction text. Character, setting, beginning, middle, end. And what? There's five lines on this graphic organizer? Character, setting, beginning, middle, end. Except it doesn't say beginning, middle, end. It says problem, events, and resolution. So in Little Red Riding Hood, a new fangled prairie tale, the characters are, the main character is Little Red Riding Hood. Her name's in the title. She's on almost every page, and it's who the story is mostly about. And the wolf wants to steal the muffins, and grandma, we know, is really tough. Mm -hmm. The setting is the where the story takes place. And it takes place in a small 
Prairie Town, and also at Grandma's house. The problem of the story is that the wolf wants to eat all the muffins. And then what happens is, you'll remember, Red is riding out to Grandma's house. The wolf distracts her. That's very similar to other versions. Uh, and then the wolf goes out, beats her to Grandma's house, and Grandma teaches the wolf to behave. Do you remember she comes flying off the tractor? Mm -hmm. And then the resolution, how they solve the problem, is that Grandma teaches the wolf to bake muffins, and they work together at the bakery that they open, but Grandma is always the one who adds the last ingredient. Now we're gonna read our new version today, The Wolf's Story, and we're gonna think about how it's similar to, and that's what we'll put in the middle where it says both, or how it's different from Little Red Riding Hood. And we're gonna add the story elements on our graphic organizer. Okay, now the first thing I noticed when I looked at the front cover of this version is that the wolf is winking. Why do you think that the wolf is winking. Take some think time. Hmm. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you're thinking. Gus, I think that wolf is up to something. And I can tell um, by the title, it says what really happened to Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf story. I think we're gonna hear this story from the wolf's point of view. We've been learning about point of view, haven't we? We've read all about Red Riding Hood's point of view and Grandma's point of view, but we don't know the wolf's side of the story. So this story is going to get us, give us an opportunity to stand in the wolf's shoes and think about what's similar and what's different. Oh, that is a scary looking wolf. Does Red Riding Hood seem to be too concerned? Not really. No, please, look at me. Would I lie to you? It was the old woman who started it. I did nothing wrong. Would I? We hit it off from the beginning. Not everyone likes a wolf, do they? Look at you. You're not certain. Would you like to come and sit a little closer while I tell you about the kid? I don't bite. No? Sure? Okay, it's up to you. Anyway, I did odd jobs for the old woman. Called her grandma, we were close. I put up shelves, did the shopping, tidied the garden. I even altered her clothes, sewed on buttons, that sort of thing. I'm versatile, it means I can do a lot of different things. I'm versatile. Sort of a new wolf, vegetarian cuisine especially. If I eat any more lettuce, I'll turn green. But that's too much information. Are you sure you wouldn't like to sit just a little closer? Every week the kid came with a big basket of toffee. I tell you that toffee was so bad it made grandma's teeth stick together. And you don't want toffee messing up your false teeth. But grandma looked forward to seeing the kid. She even made her a red cape so she could see the kid coming. Did anyone ever make me a cape? Me, I don't like the kid being here, or being there. She never spoke to me. She seemed nervous. Can you believe that? When Little Red was there, I felt left out. I tried to join in. I even offered to eat the toffee, and that stuff could ruin a wolf's good teeth. So you can see how I tried, but they just ignored me. Now, I'm noticing that the way that our author wrote this, it's the wolf is talking directly to us. And the wolf is trying to convince us that he didn't do anything wrong in the past with Little Red Riding Hood and Grandma. He wants us to believe that the problem is just that not everybody likes a wolf. In the original folktale, the wolf is usually referred to as the big bad wolf, right? And in the prairie tale, he is up to no good, very hungry wolf. So far in this version of the story, the main character, the wolf, is trying to change our impression of him. But he still looks rather scary. What do you think? 
take some think time while I add the characters and the title to our new graphic organizer. Now, who else are our characters in our new version? Little Red Riding Hood, but do they call her that? What is the wolf calling her? The kid. And I'm noticing in Little Red Riding Hood, A Newfangled Prairie Tale, the main character was Little Red Riding Hood. But in this version, the wolf is the one telling the story. So the wolf is more the main character and the kid is more of a supporting character. That's different. Oh, and the kid brings grandma toffee. That's different because in th the other version, she was bringing her muffins. What's the same when we're thinking about our characters? They all have the same characters, right? They all have Little Red Riding Hood, they all have Grandma, they all have the wolf. Also, this is different, or this is how they're the same, but it's different than the traditional tale, is that Grandma is not afraid of the wolf in either one of these versions. Okay, let's keep reading, thinking about the setting, the problem, the events, and how they solve the problem. The day it happened was like this. I saw the kid coming with her big basket of toffee. I was out looking for fresh herbs in the forest and I tried to pass the time of day with her, but she pretended not to know me and hurried on. That's the sort of kid she is. Like, I'm frightening, eh? Then I scooted back the quick way to warn grandma to hide her teeth from the toffee. The kid always took a long time to get there. You know how slow kids are? When I got back, Grandma was reaching for her best dress in the wardrobe and couldn't reach the hook. And this is where it all went wrong. Okay, where is the setting? Where is this story taking place? Take some think time. Mm-hmm, it tells us. I was out looking for fresh herbs in the forest. And it also takes place at grandma's house. So the setting in the forest, that's different. But what's the same? Grandma's house. Now, so far, what's the problem? What's the wolf trying to tell us the problem is? Yeah, he feels left out. That's different. Little Red Riding Hood, the prairie tale, the wolf wanted to eat the muffins. The wolf wasn't feeling left out. Oops, feels.
Now, what's the same? What happens in both or what's similar? Take some think time. Hmm. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you're thinking. Gus, in both of these versions, it's the wolf that's having a problem. The wolf wants to eat the muffins and the wolf feels left out. Mm. I know. How come nobody ever feels badly for the wolf? Because no one thinks of the story from the wolf's perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're starting to get into the events here where the wolf gets back to the grandma's house. Think about what's happening next. Because this is, it says, and this is the part where it all went wrong. I tried to help her get it, but she fell over right into the wardrobe. And you know how it is. Grandma got a teeny tiny bump on her head that knocked her cold. And the kid was banging on the door. All right, I panicked. It looked bad. Not everyone trusts a wolf. I thought they might say I'd done something bad to grandma. Me? Anyway, I shut the wardrobe, put the dress on, sort of thought I could cover it up and pretend to be grandma till she was better. I have to admit, I don't have the best legs for a dress. So I jumped into the bed. Anyone would have thought I was grandma. Okay, here what's happening. The wolf is wearing grandma's clothes. Does the wolf in A Newfangled Prairie Tale wear grandma's clothes? Hmm. Now I remember, I remember what was different about that version is that grandma was wearing overalls. Did the wolf ever wear overalls? Mm -mm. Nope. We need to add that because that's part of our events is that grandma bumps her head. And the wolf pretends to be her. Oh, okay. In both versions, I'm noticing the wolf distracts her little red riding hood in a newfangled prairie tale. And in the wolf's version, the wolf also races ahead to get to grandma's house before the kid. That's the same. Ooh, it's kind of a scary picture. Then the kid came in and started acting strange. She was pretending to be scared again and she wouldn't come close. Oh, grandma, she said, what big eyes you have. Get rid of my glasses, I told her. I've got these new contacts. They really smart. When you first put them in, they make anyone's eyes look big. It was the first time we'd had a talk and she wasn't that bad really. Looked good enough to eat if you know what I mean. Oh, Grandma, she said, what big ears you have. Now, these are good ears, but I have to admit, they aren't a lot like Grandma's, and of course, they're pretty furry. Oh, these old things, I said, and changed the subject. Oh, Grandma, she said, what big teeth you have, and this was what made it worse. She was about to pop one of her sticky toffees into my mouth, and I couldn't stand that. So I leaped out of bed, and it may have looked as though I was going to eat her or something. Then she started screaming, Woof, woof, you've eaten my grandma! Do I look like the sort of wolf who goes around eating grandmas? It got worse. The door swung open. There was a woodsman the size of a tree, with an ax. I shouted for help, but grandma was still out cold in the wardrobe. That's like the dresser or the closet. Grandma was still out cold in the wardrobe. She would tell you the truth. She really would. The woodsman took a swing at me and I was this 
close to being a fur coat. I jumped out of that window with the sound of the ax crashing down behind me. I ran all the way to town and I have to tell you, a wolf in a dress is an embarrassed wolf. People were laughing and that's not nice. Anyway, thanks for listening. And if you ever want any odd jobs done around your house, just get in touch. Here's my card, I'm cheap, I'm a neat worker, completely trustworthy, and I won't make a meal of it. No, please, look at me. Would I lie to you? Now, how did the endings of both of our versions compare? Now, in the traditional version of the folktale, the wolf gets a beating or even doesn't survive. Now, I'm thinking about how things worked out very differently for the wolf in the end of both of our versions. In the wolf's version, the woodsman chops off his tail. Poof. As he runs away. In the prairie version, grandma teaches the wolf to bake muffins, but she always adds the last ingredients. So in both versions, the wolf survives. But he's compromised. Very compromised. You, do you notice that small detail, the bandage on the end of his tail? Woof. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we read, we make connections, whether you notice that you're doing it or not, to other texts that you read. You're thinking about what is similar and what is different when you're thinking about your five story elements of character, setting, beginning, middle, end. So as you're reading your fiction, your traditional folk tales, think about what is the same, what is different. You'll notice they all have characters, they all have a setting, they all have a beginning, middle, end with a problem, events, and a solution. But what's different about those? That's gonna be your independent work today, is to think about that as you read your independent reading texts. Because today we're learning to notice patterns what's the same, what's happening over and over, and make text-to-text -text connections as you read a lot of different texts. And that's gonna help you better understand and remember your stories as you go forward as a reader. Now, after reading your stories, complete this graphic organizer for two different books that you have read. You can send this to us along with a note about what you like about your books or what you didn't like. And Mr. Kevin, where can they send us those, that graphic organizer? Well, sure, the kids can send this to TV Classroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us. That's via email using an email machine. I have one of those. You do? I do. I, I think we all do now, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> or you can send it via the regular mail, and that would be to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. We look forward to receiving your work. Now, second graders, this is time for your affirmation. This is the time of the day when we get to build ourselves up before we go off to complete our independent work. And today I want to remind you that you can be an independent learner. You are an independent learner. I am an independent learner. Say that out loud with me right now. I am an independent learner. Excellent job today, second graders. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow in our TV classroom. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.